Welcome once again. Right now we're at Acts chapter 21 verses 17 to 26. And this is a hot one, okay? I've been looking forward to doing this for a long time now. This passage of scripture is the most overlooked, the most un misunderstood passage of all the so-called New Testament scriptures. Paul proves that he does not teach anyone to forsake Torah. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. The following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he reported one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Paul just got back from three missionary journeys, okay? Missionary journeys to Gentile territory. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching repentance. He was preaching Jesus, as we read in the past several sessions. But now he's coming home. Now he's coming back to the disciples, to the 12 apostles. Remember, Paul is not one of the 12, okay? He never was, never will be. He did not take the place of Judas. Matthias did. That is very clear. Now, some people really add to the scriptures by saying, well, Paul replaced Matthias. Well, <laughs> where do you get that? Paul never replaced any of the 12 disciples. He was never part of the 12 disciples. He was under the 12 disciples. That's the reason why he decided to come back to his so-called home church report to James and to the elders what had happened, what God did through him in the Gentile territories. I mean, you can just imagine, he's like, listen, listen, Yaakov, which would be James' real name, Yaakov, and all the, all the elders. And you know, a lot of the elders were probably all the other apostles and some of the other key figures in the life of Yeshua. So Paul's coming back and he's saying, listen, listen to the stories I got. Listen to the testimony. I got a great testimony to tell you guys. And he goes one by one, how God did miraculous things and mighty works and was saving the Gentiles, bringing them to repentance. And now they're coming to the faith, the same faith they have. Verse 20, they, when they heard it, glorified God. So like James and all the elders that were there, they were like, hey, Paul, that's great. That's great to hear. You know, praise God. Hallelujah. God is doing great things among the Gentiles. They said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. James and all the other elders, which are probably most likely all Jews, was saying to Paul, okay, listen, it's great what God is doing among the Gentiles. But see how many thousands of us, we're all Jews here and we all believe, okay? There's this core group of Jewish people, Jewish believers. Like today, it's pretty much the opposite. It's like a core group of Gentiles. And where are, where are the Jewish believers today? I mean, few and far between. Back then, it was the opposite. It's like the core group, the core group were Jewish believers, so James and all the elders were making a point here. You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. Very, very important point here. Listen, all these Jews that believe, these people are Christians in, in the very purest sense of the word. These are, we are really Christians. Thousands of Jews here. We are Christians, but they're zealous for the law, zealous for Torah. Okay, very, very important here. They didn't say, oh, that's great, Paul. Yeah, that's great, you know, and just leave it as that. They said, no, that's great, Paul, but listen, don't forget Torah. Don't forget Torah. See how many thousands of Jews that have come to believe and they're all zealous for Torah. They didn't say, James and all the others did not say, well, they were, you know, they they were zealous for Torah, but now we're not under Torah no more. Now we're not under Torah. You know, we don't go by Torah. You know, Jesus nailed it to the cross. God forbid they did not say that. They have been informed about you, that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. That phrase, forsake Moses, means forsake Torah, okay? 
in the Jewish mind, Moses and Torah are they're synonymous, okay? They have been informed about you that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, to forsake the Torah, telling them not to circumcise their children and not to walk after the customs. The customs. The Pharisees were very well known for being pro-Torah and pro-customs, okay? The Sadducees, on the other hand, were just pro-Torah. They're like sola scriptura, you know, scripture alone, let's, let's forget about the customs. Whereas the Pharisees were about the customs too. So they're saying to Paul, okay, it's great what God's doing with, among the Gentiles, but wait a second here, wait a second. Let's not lose perspective, okay? We got thousands of us Jews. I know there might be just a few of these Gentiles coming in, praise God for that. I mean, that's strange to hear about Gentiles getting saved and coming to faith in Jesus, but I mean, with thousands of us Jews and we're all zealous for Torah. Now, if Jesus taught anybody against Torah, don't you think they would know about it? No, they were like, no, listen, we're all pro-Torah here. We're not just pro-Torah, we're zealous for Torah. And Paul, there's a little red flag here somewhere because we've heard there's rumor going around that you're teaching people to forsake Torah. Is that true, Paul? Is that right? Verse 22, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and purify yourself with them and pay their expenses for them, that they may shave their heads. Then all will know that there is no truth no truth in the things that they have been informed about you, but that you yourself also walk keeping the law. You yourself also walk keeping the Torah. Now, this is what you need to get. Paul comes back. This is what's going on. This is what God's doing among the Gentiles. And they're like, yeah, it's great. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. But Paul, there's a rumor going around that you are teaching people to forsake Torah. You're teaching people to forsake the customs and not to circumcise their men. If it's not true, this is what we want you to do. We need you to take four men with yourself, that makes five of you in total, and all take a vow, you know, shaving your heads, okay, and paying for the vow. Now, in context, obviously, this is talking about the what they call the Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6, okay, because that's the only vow in the Jewish culture and in the Torah where it requires you to shave your heads and to, and to offer sacrifices and offerings and such. Now, taking the Nazarite vow is expensive because you've got to pay for these sacrifices. You've got to pay for these offerings, okay? Which is not cheap, not cheap at all. I mean, go try, go buying an ox today. Go buy a lamb today. It's not cheap. And so they're saying to Paul, listen, we got the ultimate solution here. We've got the ultimate way to prove to the world that you're not against Torah and you're not teaching anybody against Torah. You're not teaching anybody to forsake Torah. This is how you can prove it. Take four men and pay for all of their expenses and yourself and take the Nazarite vow. I mean, who knows? It might have cost Paul pretty much everything he had. So it's very, very expensive. It's very costly. But the Nazarite vow is the most strict vow in all of the Torah. You can't eat grapes. You can't even eat grape skin. You can't even drink grape juice. You can't touch dead bodies. And you got to let your hair grow, okay? Letting your hair grow for a certain period of time. Now, the Nazarite vow, there is no any particular specific regulations on how long you're supposed to be under this vow. And it's kind of assumed that you kind of set the time yourself, okay? Some people were under the Nazarite vow for all of their life, like Samson, like John the Baptist, okay? But other people, they can be under the Nazarite vow for a number of days, weeks, months, years, whatever duration they see fit. So taking the Nazarite vow is like the epitome of Torah observance. Demanding that a man take the Nazarite vow to prove that he is not against Torah, it's like demanding that someone go skydiving to prove that they're not afraid of heights, okay? It's like the epitome of proof, okay? So like the core and the leaders of the church, okay? The New Testament, 
Book of Acts church, the leaders were like, Paul, you have to prove because the rumor has it that you're saying stuff against Torah that, you know, like, you know, we don't have to observe Torah anymore and, you know, to kind of forsake Torah now, you know, because maybe perhaps you're under grace, but um, you got to prove that this is not right. Number one, you take the Nazarite vow. Yes, the most strict vow in Torah, the hardest vow to fulfill in Torah and the most expensive vow in Torah. And not only do we require require you to do it for yourself, but also for four other men. Ha! Uh-huh. Yeah, you might have to sell your house there, Paul, but listen, you got some proving to do here, buddy. Verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written our decision that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from food offered to idols, from blood, from strangled things, and from sexual immorality. Now, I dealt with this in Acts chapter 15. I'm just going to do a quick little recap, but I encourage every one of you to go back and listen to the session from Acts chapter 15, because this is what James is talking about here when he says, we have made our decision, we have, you know, we wrote it down. This is what we, we require of the Gentiles. Now, just as a little teaser here, or just as a little appetizer here, the regulations and the laws that are required of the Gentiles for them to be saved, and that's what they're talking about here, which they enumerate here, are in essence what we would call today the Noachai laws. The Jewish people today, those who are in Judaism today, when a Gentile comes in and wants to be converted to Judaism, they say you got to start with the Noachai laws. And this is in essence, it is pretty much the same thing. That's why the apostles chose these particular laws and restrictions to put on the Gentiles who want to get saved. Because they know in order to enter the faith, in order for any Gentile to enter the faith, they have to start with. And that's the key. It is entry-level Judaism, okay? Entry-level Judaism. That's what James is talking about here. These are, in essence, the Noahide laws, okay? This is first century Christianity, which is first century Judaism. And this is one of the key proofs of that fact. Verse 26, then Paul took the men and the next day purified himself and went with them into the temple, declaring the fulfillment of the days of purification until the offering was offered for every one of them. Very, very significant here. Yes, they did offerings, sacrifices, animal sacrifices. These are first century Christians. First century Christians going to the temple with their offerings, with their sacrifices, with their animals to be sacrificed according to the Torah to prove that they are not against Torah. To prove that they do not teach anyone to forsake Torah. This is awesome. This is one of the key verses. There are others, but this is one of the key verses that proves that Jesus isn't the so-called ultimate sacrifice, okay? This is one of the key passages that proves that the apostles still did sacrifices in the temple after Jesus died and rose again and ascended. This is key. This is awesome. This is beautiful. Seek God with all your heart and you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.